I gotta show you that like Don Moncrief from a well-fed world just gave me a well-fed world shirt and I am so stoked about this that I want it on camera. So like give like Don a round of applause for helping me out, saving the day and giving me a shirt. Um, I just finished up my last talk like 10 minutes ago and like, you know, so, so like we're just jumping right into this one and we're a little bit late getting started. Dawn, you can start the timer now. We're going to try to keep this at like 30, 35 minutes um, so that we don't go over time. Um, you know, we want to allow for like 10 minutes for questions and like, you know, and then allow you to like have time to get to your, uh, to, to your next talk, whoever it is that you're listening to, because I'm excited about like all of the speakers that are going to be here today. And like, you know, so I don't want to be uncharitable to anybody who's coming after me. So like, you know, I, I want to make sure that you have time to like get your seats and, and get in there so I'm just gonna jump in like you know into this lecture um, and w without like you know much preamble I'll just introduce myself um, a lot of you probably already know me or at least like all of my friends from Facebook I see you out here um, <laughs> um, but for those of you who, do, who don't know who I am like you know and and managed to like wander into this room anyway for whatever reason like I'm Christopher Sebastian um, I work with vegan publishers I'm a staff writer for them I also work for Vine Sanctuary which is a queer run sanctuary in Vermont in the United States um, run by, by, by Patrice and Miriam. They're uh, like very good friends of mine. Um, I adore them and like, you know, and I'm super proud to, to actually like be on their staff, even though I have not been very productive in the past couple of months, but I've been just like wildly busy with so many other projects going on. Um, I also um, work with Peace Advocacy Network. I'm the social media manager. We do a 30-day vegan pledge, which has been spectacular this past year, and I couldn't be prouder than um, that, like, for, for all of the work that we've been doing, like, all of the people who are on the board of directors since this is being recorded, I'm just going to shout out to, like, Leila and Nick Vaughn and your son, Miles, who have been hosting me, letting me sleep in your spare room for, like, you know, for, for weeks on end while I've been traveling from city to city, doing, like, you know, all of, all of these presentations for the Vegan Pledge program all summer long, um, and everybody else who's been on the board of directors. Um, and I also teach speciesism at Columbia University. Usually when I have conversations about animal oppression and about speciesism, they're centered around race. Um, the lecture that I just did in another room that was not recorded was race, class, and species. Um, but today I, I actually get to talk about like, you know, like queering animal liberation. You can see it's the title of the talk. Um, you know, like, and, and like, you know, and it's really refreshing for me to actually be able to talk about this, this other, like, you know, the, this, this other type of, of oppression and how it relates to animal, um, animal oppression and, and speciesism. Um, you know, just because there's so much queer theory that can be applied to animal liberation and like, you know, and, and we don't really like, you know, we, we don't really get to explore that in any meaningful way, or at least I don't get to explore that in any meaningful way. So the fact that I actually get to do this talk, you know, is like, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really great for me and I hope you all enjoy it. Like we're not gonna be able to like, you know, discuss the, the, the sheer breadth of, um, of, of animal rights theory and, and queer, queer theory, like, you know, in 30, 35 minutes. But we're just gonna cover, like, the main bits. Um, we're gonna, like, give a brief, ex brief explanation of what queer theory is, um, and then we're going to like get into how it applies to to animal rights and and animal justice and you know and then we're going to talk about like you know how our current constructions of animal rights activism like is is like you know it's it's not in exactly the most inclusive space for queer voices so like you know so we'll get started um, queering animal liberation welcome if this is not the right lecture for you it's too late the doors are closed and you can't get out. Um, queering animal liberation gender is a construct Santa Claus isn't real and animals fuck deal with it. So we're going to have a lot of fun in this room, or at least I'm going to have a lot of fun. If you guys don't, then that's shame on you. Um, but yeah, like, you know, we're, like three main points about queer theory that I want to bring up in the very beginning. Gender is a construct. Um, you know, and like, I'll just, I'll, 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 I'll read these slides off to you. The, the three main points, number one, gender is a construct. Queer theory explains that we're constantly performing these narratives and structures of maleness, femaleness, straightness, normalness, etc. When you get up in the morning, put on a skirt and desperately try to find a husband for your overbearing mother considers you a failure, you're taking part in a production of power in which we're all implicated. Number two, fucking is political. This is a really important one. Who, who, who gave me an amen? Let's, let's say that again. <laughs> Fucking is political, like, you know, it, it, it really is. Um, if refusing to perform the script of heterosexuality is radical, then the same applies for non-heterosexual sex. Thinkers like Lee Edelman, who will be discussed later, um, even think sodomy is the key to capitalism's destruction. Um, like, it, it, but hey, listen, like, you know, I, I, I've been sodomized and, uh, and, and have done so to others, and it's like, it, I can see how it could like be imbued with that power. Wow, this microphone just got like way more powerful. Um, and it's slightly phallic, so I'm just gonna hold it a little bit further away. 
It's the sodomy that did it, isn't it? <laughs> Some queer theorists have proposed the idea of genderfuck as a political strategy for disrupting the heteronormative, heteronormative narrative. Genderfucking, which begat the most unfortunate name of a Wikipedia section ever, is not limited to sex, but also includes drag, cross-dressing, and other forms of gender bending, um, which not just human animals, but other animals have also engaged in as well. We'll discuss that a little bit later on as, uh, um, as well. <laughs> <laughs> Did you all think that I wasn't going to include at least some sort of critical race theory in this? Because all of these things apply. Um, white people ruin everything. Um, it's, it's very unfortunate. But like, yeah, while Europeans were busy colonizing the world, modes of queer sexuality were alive and well in non-white cultures. Um, while Europeans were busy defining... You're all Europeans, aren't you? Oh, this is bad news for me. Um, you know, while, while Europeans were, <laughs> were, were busy defining what entailed proper manly activities like wrestling bears and beating your wife, Native American cultures in particular were holding on to their own queerness from the onslaught of genocidal white folks. Many Native cultures had a third gender, often called two-spirit, that was comprised of feminine and masculine qualities. And of course, it was usually those sexually deviant Native peoples that were the first to be slaughtered by European colonizers. Authors like Scott Morganson have argued that the terrorizing sexual colonization of Native peoples was an historical root of the biopolitics of modern sexuality in the United States. Now, like, you know, I speak about this from a US perspective because I myself am an American, in case you all hadn't guessed. Um, but yeah, like, this can be applied to larger, like, you know, Western society as a whole. And I want to make sure that everyone is aware that none of this actually comes from me. Like, you know, like, because, like, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel, I just wanted to come up with, like, you know, like, what, with, like, what I consider to be the, the main points of, like, you know, of, of gender. Um, or excuse me, of queer theory, like as described by someone else who's far smarter than me. So like, this comes from Eugene Walters, what the fuck is queer theory? Um, so you can like, you know, look up more information there. Um, and like as we, as we proceed, it says, uh, the problem isn't that white people came along and destroyed nine white forms of queer existences long before the Stonewall riots. I mean, that's also a huge problem. The problem is that modern queer narratives have not only eluded their settler colonial past, but are also centered around the figure of the white affluent male. Andrea Smith, um, in Queer Theory and Native Studies, the heteronormativity of settler colonialism goes as far as to call queer theory the magician's assistant, excuse me, the magi magician's assistant to, to whiteness's disappearing act. Um, so yeah, like these, these are, those are like the, that's the main overview of like, you know, for me anyway, of, of, of queer theory. Now I just wanted to like, you know, just briefly discuss with you, should I walk in front of that? Oh yeah, no, that's gonna create a shadow. So I'm just gonna like, I'll, I'll walk up here a little bit and get closer to the audience. Like I just wanna discuss the ways in which we apply queer theory to animal rights. Um, and there are like, you know, there are just like four or five points that I wanna make. Um, number one, breeding and forcible impregnation are themselves a theft of sexual autonomy. Um, and like, you know, I mentioned this point in particular and like, you know, again, like I see, I see my, my, my favorite people, like Rafaela, you're, you're in the audience and, and Don, you're out there well, um, as well. You, this isn't new to some of you, you've heard me say this before. Um, you know, I think that like, you know, it's worth bringing up here the, the rape discourse that we talk about very frequently in our animal rights activism. Um, you know, I personally, like all other people will probably disagree with me. I expect people to disagree with me. They do it all the time on Facebook and I'll probably hear about it after this talk. But like, you know, personally, I don't find it to be the most productive thing to talk about in our discourse around like, you know, in, in, in the, like, you know, the sexual enslavement of other species. Um, you know, I think that like the way that we talk about rape in particular is inherently flawed and it's vaguely inaccurate. But when we actually talk about like the intentions behind the act of raping someone, it becomes a little bit more murky because usually rape is like, you know, it's a, it's a construct around domination and power. Um, rape is very, very rarely about sex. It's about that domination and power. And that's kind of absent from like the, the like stolen sexual, like, you know, the, the so, stolen sexual reproduction. Um, it's not about dem domination and power. Like when we, like, you know, when we steal someone else's reproductive autonomy, it's like, it's for an economic interest. Um, and for me, that makes it actually a bit more insidious because it's, it's, it's not about like rape the way that we talk about it in human cultures. Like, you know, like actually forcibly impregnating someone and stealing their child. You know, that is like, it's no doubt a sexual violation and it's no doubt an act of sexual assault. But I wouldn't call it rape because of the, like, you know, all of the implications of rape. Um, when we look at it as, 
as a sexual violation for an economic interest. That's a bit more insidious to me. Um, and calling it sexual assault, calling it a sexual violation, I feel like is a more inclusive way to have that conversation. Because we're not just hyper-focusing on one species and the female of that species, no less. We're talking about it more broadly. And we visit like the, 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 the many ways that we commit acts of sexual violence against other species. Um, it's not strictly limited to dairy cows. Like we steal others, um, you know, we steal, we, we commit acts of sexual violence in a variety of ways. Um, you know, like, and, and like there are going to be some like really, like, you know, really troubling images that come up in this presentation. Usually I warn people in advance and I apologize if like, you know, if anybody is looking at this and they're like, they're a bit triggered by this image. Um, that wasn't my intention. Um, like, you know, the, the next couple of images are going to be a bit troubling because they are like, you know, what we're literally looking at is an act of like, you know, is an, an, an act of sexual aggression, an act of sexual assault against someone. And we should definitely be talking about that. It's not limited to dairy cows. It's not simply an act of penetration. Like, you know, when we talk about that, like when we hyper focus on one species and like, you know, we, we're, we're erasing all of the other types of like violence that we that we do. This is a meaningful type of violence. You know, when we look at like a bull who's being ejaculated for his sperm and having that stolen, when we look at this happening to a horse, when we look at this happening to someone, what usually, what's usually the conversation that happens around that? We hear people saying, well, I'm sure the horse or the bull enjoyed that. Like, you know, and, and so they're not allowed to experience the type of emotional trauma that comes from a sexual violation. It's just supposed to be excusable because they should enjoy it. And what does that tell us? Like, you know, in, in larger conversations, it, it, it really speaks to, like, how we reproduce, like, you know, violence, emotional violence against, like, men and boys in human society. Like, boys have the capacity to be raped. But what happens when, like, you know, a female student rapes a, like, you know, a, a, a or excuse me, a female teacher rapes a male student? Um, or when, when an act of sexual violence happens to a boy, he's expected to enjoy it it's supposed to be okay. He, like, you know, and if he doesn't enjoy it, then there's something wrong with him. This reinforces, all this reinforces a culture of toxic masculinity. Um, you know, and, and we should be aware of that. We should be able to call that out and identify that. You know, like when, we, when we erase sexual violence from, from, from our human boys, when we erase acts of sexual violence against like, you know, like male, like assigned male um, bodies of other species, like, you know, that's, that, that, that's, that's a very meaningful. That is itself a very political act. You know, like, he, he doesn't, we don't know whether he's enjoying that or not. Chances are he probably isn't. Chances are he's probably wondering what the fuck is going on. Like, you know, like, but we don't know that. But when we, like, reinforce that toxic masculinity, when we reinforce that narrative, that is very meaningfully, like, reproducing an act of violence against someone. And in this case, emotional violence. Men and boys and other species, they should be allowed to, they should be allowed to have the autonomy and the agency to experience those types of violations as well, to experience the emotional trauma of those violations. And we do not erase that from others. How many of you actually recognize this? This is, this is, this is a pig actually being castrated. Um, you know, and, and like there are, there are so many images of this to choose from like on the internet, it's, it's not even funny. I can't believe, like, you know, like it, it's enormously like disturbing to me that we, we have these images all over the place. Does anybody know why pigs get castrated? No? Often, like, you know, it's, it's, like, it's always centered around, like, you know, advantaging humans in our society. Pigs are castrated um, for a number of reasons. Number one, because of boar taint. Male pigs, as they approach sexual maturity, actually have a different flavor that's usually unpalatable to humans. So whenever people talk about bacon is so good, no the fuck it's not. Um, not only is it disgusting because you're actually eating the shaved flesh off of someone's stomach, but like, you know, but, but no, like bortane actually changes the taste to, of, of, of male body pigs um, to be really like, you know, really not very, not very flavorful for, for humans to consume. So like, you know, like it's, it's, it's a big problem, um, but it's not the only reason why male pigs get castrated. Male pigs are also castrated to minimize aggression in like, you know, in, in herds. Um, and that again is like, you know, for the advantage of like of humans because like humans like pigs are like they're naturally very large and can be very aggressive persons and like you know and because of their size because they're mostly composed of muscle and because they have a low center of gravity they're dangerous to us and so we actually remove their genitals we commit an act of genital mutilation 
um, male genital mutilation you know, to, to advantage and to benefit us. And this is itself another act of, like, you know, of, of, of sexual violence. And so we, like, you know, when we, when we, when we like, reduce the, the conversation about sexual violence and sexual assault against other species to, like, you know, to, to strictly the, the rape of dairy cows, the way that we're given to talking about it in mainstream activist circles, we're actually doing ourselves a disservice. I find it to be much more productive to actually expand that conversation and talk about sexual violence um, in a meaningful way as it's enacted against multiple species. We also, like, you know, when we hyper-focus on dairy cows in our activism, um, we also, like, erase the, the other types of like, you know, reproductive autonomy that are stolen. Yes, they're, they're forcibly impregnated, and I refer to it as forcible impregnation. Um, you know, but but like, forcible impregnation is not the only way that we steal someone else's reproductive autonomy. We steal the reproductive autonomy of other species in so many ways. The, like, you know, the, the species that are most exploited in our like, system of industrial agriculture are, are like, aquatic species, fish, and chickens. Um, you know, and so like when we when we just focus on like you know on on having a conversation about rape, like it's it's very like you know it's very reductive because like you know we're we're just erasing all of these other types of like you know all all these other types of violence against other species um, from the conversation because it's not just that act of like you know penetrating um, a, a a cow's anatomy. Um, it's like it's it's so much more than that, and so like you know, and and expanding the conversation to talk about like you know like like reproductive autonomy, um, reproductive agency, I think is much more productive because it, it it has so much more impact. Like you know, chickens should not be forced to ovulate for for human benefit. Like you know, fish should not be forced to reproduce. Um, you know, and because these are non-mammalian species, like you know, they're automatically excluded from that talk of of rape. It's all a part of a system of sexual violence. So, yeah, we talk about that. Um, also, like another way that like you know queer theory can be applied to animal rights is the forced sterilization of other animals in the name of protecting them prevents them from exploring their sexual identities. How many of us have like an animal companion in the home, a dog or a cat or or a rabbit or like you know loads of us have like you know have have extended family members um, who are not of the human species, which is great by the way. I'm so glad that I, mean, I hope everybody was adopted. And, and didn't, oh good, 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 good. Um, like, you know, like, how often do we reinforce the narrative that, you know, your, your animal companion needs to be sterilized? You know, they need to be fixed. They need to be spayed or neutered. Um, we talk about like spay neuter programs as inherently beneficial, but we are never taught to interrogate the larger conversation about what that means for those animals. Because when we actually like, when we actually castrate someone, when we actually like force them to be sterile in like, you know, in almost infancy, what we're doing is robbing them of the opportunity to explore their sexual selves. What if as a toddler, you had your genitals taken away and or you were like, you know, you were sterilized so that you would never reproduce? You would probably be a very different person today than if you were allowed to reach sexual maturity. And I'm not saying that we should just, like, you know, we, we automatically need to, like, you know, throw out the, the invention altogether of, like, you know, of, of, of sterilization. But I think that we should definitely look at, like, you know, why we do it and how we do it and, and, and consider the gravity of, of what we're doing to someone else. And like this can be applied to human communities as well, because whenever we talk about forcing someone to be sterilized, there's usually like you know there's there's usually a much more dominant person who ain't, ain't being sterilized at all, by the way, like you know who's who's reinforcing this narrative that it's for their own good. Like we've had conversations about like you know about how how like women and especially girls in India um, or in other countries, sometimes like in, even in the United States, are forced like are forced to be sterilized. And there's always a much more dominant force. Again, white people ruin everything. Like, you know, there's, like it's usually like, you know, someone who is in power or someone who is like, you know, who, who, who has the capacity to reproduce white supremacy or reproduce whiteness or has some proximity to whiteness who's making decisions for someone else, especially for their reproductive health. Um, we see prison populations who experience forced sterilization all the time. Women in prisons are routinely 
forced to be sterilized. And it's always someone else in power who's making that decision. So what we do to other species absolutely directly influences what we do to one another. And we do need to interrogate that. We do need to interrogate the importance of that and the gravity of that. Whether or not we're making those reproductive decisions on our own for the individuals who are parts of our family, we definitely need to take more responsibility for the structure that's in place that, 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 that causes this to be quote unquote necessary to begin with. And this is not a decision that we should ever make lightly, um, you know, because we are like influencing the direction of someone else's life. Sometimes cats and dogs in particular are able to like, you know, to continue to explore their sexual identities independently of being sterilized. But like when, but, but like, that's not always the case. Um, oftentimes it's done very haphazardly. And like, you know, and so they, they are effectively like, you know, that, that part of their life is effectively removed forever. And whether or not like, you know, their, their sexual identity remains intact, we're still actually making a decision on whether or not this person, and I do regard other species communities as moral persons, will be able to have a family ever. And think about whether or not you would want that to happen to you. And that's really important, that's relevant. Continuing this dialogue. Pronoun use. Pronouns, um, pronoun use shapes our perceptions of one another. How many of us, myself included, have referred to someone of another species community as it? Yeah. How many of us have actually considered how objectifying and demoralizing that is to call someone else an it? I still do it. I still do it. I catch myself when I do it now. But like I haven't always caught myself and I try to be more conscious of it in the present. But yeah, like, you know, like we're talking about like individual persons, like in the English language, which already like, you know, don't get me started on the hegemony of like, you know, of, of English language and like, you know, and, and it's like, you know, profundity through, throughout like the Western world. But, but in the English language, like, you know, we refer to male bodies as he, and we refer to female bodies as she. And if we don't know the preferred gender of someone, hopefully everybody in this room, since you're coming to a talk that incorporates a lot of queer theory, uses the word they. But we should never call someone else an it. We should never call someone else an object. And so we really need to Re reimagine how we like you know how we how we frame language in our society to refer to other persons and always change the conversation when we're like having it ourselves or when someone else is having the conversation to make sure that 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 they is used i'm going to disclose something that's going to be on camera now and i'll probably get in trouble for it later if anybody i work with finds out about it but like I like you know like I'm a copy editor like full disclosure I work with a lot of like you know a lot of reports for the federal government and like from time to time before like you know a report like is is final like I will go back and refer to like because like often these are environmental assessments or environmental impact statements and like you know and and these are like you know there are a lot of incredible incredibly smart biologists and like and scientists that contribute to these reports that are talking about other animal species but they always use it and I get really, really frustrated at that. Sometimes they stop me and they say, Sebastian, what are you doing here? Why, why did you change this? But I change it to they. Just to, like, you know, just to kind of change the conversation a little bit. And, like it, and what's really telling is that when people do change it back to it, because I'm not always successful, by the way. But like when, 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 when people do change it back to it, it's because they recognize that this is, like, you know, that, that this is an inherently political act. And so you're reading a sentence where you're referring to a, a person of another species or from another species community, and you come across the word they. That act itself is so revolutionary that, like, that, that, that it shakes people to their core. This is the power, this is the, like, this, this, this is the real power of language every day in our lives. That when you see like, someone that you would ordinarily refer to as an object, referred to as an individual person, for the first time, you need to assert your dominance, you need to assert your authority and change it back to it because the idea of them being looked at as a person, as a they instead of an object, is frightening to you. And it decenters humans as the default in who is considered a person in our society. 
So definitely, pronoun use absolutely shakes or shapes like, you know, the way that we perceive one another. Queer violence and animal violence are extensions of cisgender heteropatriarchal domination. Does everybody in the room understand what, I talk, what I'm talking about when I say cisgender? Because I know that there are probably some non-native English speakers in the room. Okay, just to like, you know, to, to put it out there, when you are a cisgender person, like you are a person who already identifies with the gender that you were assigned at birth. I am a cisgender male, even though I am a queer identified male, like, you know, gay in particular. But I'm still cisgender because I still identify as male. I don't identify with another gender. By the way, there are more than two genders. Is everyone aware of that? I want to make sure that we are all aware that like scientists, social scientists have discovered that there are upwards of 40 genders. I think we're up to 50 genders now. Like there are so many different genders. The gender binary is absolutely dead. Fuck that shit. <laughs> But yeah, so, so, so yeah, like, you know, th this, is, this is like, you know, like queer violence and animal violence absolutely inform upon one another. And like, you know, and they're all extensions of this cisgender heteropatriarchal domination that we're all a part of. Um, erasure of sexual diversity and gender presentation in animal communities contributes to the erasure of sexual diversity in human communities, full stop, full stop. Like when we talk about like, you know, when we talk about like the, the, the act of other species having sex, like, it's, it, it's very different from the way that we talk about sex in, in human communities. When we talk about sex in human communities, we talk about the importance of love. We talk about the importance of agency, the autonomy of being able to choose your partner. Like, you know, we talk about romance. We talk about all of these things, which are all very recent, by the way. Thank you. Um, and, you know, and, and we, we, when we talk about, like, you know, when we talk about relationships between other species, they're reduced to a mere biological imperative. There's this almost compulsory, like, um, um, heterosexuality that we impose on other species that we do not impose upon ourselves. Patrice Jones actually talks about that. She talks about the presumption of heterosexuality. We'll bring up Patrice a little bit later on, but I'm at nine minutes right now, so I'm talking really fast because we want to get through everything. Um, you know, like, as a person who is myself a member of the queer community, I get really frustrated when I'm trying to have this conversation with other um, gay men. Like, this is an image from the gay rodeo, because we actually reproduce, rather than trying to, like, you know, rather than trying to deconstruct the paradigm of, like, of, of cisgender heteropatriarchal domination and, like, and, and indeed cisgender heteropatriarchal capitalism, we reinforce it, because instead of trying to deconstruct it, we're trying to find our own place within it, and we're trying to get more power and more privilege in a society that already looks at white straight maleness as the pinnacle of personhood rather than taking that paradigm and knocking its foundation out from under it. And like these are some of the ways that we do it in the vegan community. I really don't, like I, I, I hesitated to include this slide because I didn't want to like call anybody out. But this is like, you know, um, like this is a vegan event that we're trying to put on in, in, in 2017 that I came across when I was actually looking at like other events that I wanted to attend. And like, and, and you see the lineup, you've got like, you know, and I don't have anything against any of these, well, I mean, I might have something against it, one or two of these people, but like, you know, but like, like largely speaking, there's nothing wrong with these people as speakers, but there's an absence of female identified persons, and there's an absence of queer persons in this image, in this lineup, and there's this reinforcement and normalization of cisgender maleness. Um, you know, and, and indeed, like overwhelmingly white maleness. Um, so, so yeah, like, you know, you, you see like there's this, this, this sort of toxic masculinity, like we're re reproducing that in our activism. Um, this is an image of Nate Diaz. Some of you are familiar with him. Like nobody gave two shits about Nate Diaz until they figured out that he was vegan, which is still even like something of a questionable like claim because some people say, oh, he still eats fish and eggs. Um, and like, you know, and, and some people are like, no, he doesn't. And so like, you know, I like, I'm, I'm unaware, but like, you know, but until like there were conversations about his veganness coming up, like Nate Diaz was really not on many of our radars, but all of a sudden, why did he become popular? Because like, we're reinforcing a narrative that like, you know, look, look, you can be strong and masculine and you can beat other people to a pulp and eat plants. <laughs> why the fuck that should she be, a, be a part of our activism? It really shouldn't be. But we reinforce these narratives. And it's not about like, you know, 
like some people will say like, oh, well, you're just making animal activism about you, 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 and like, you know, and, and, and queer people, and it should be about the animals. Yes, this is about the animals, because when we erase queer identities in human communities, we erase queer identities in other animal communities. And believe it or not, there is an enormous diversity in, 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 in sexual orientation and gender presentation all throughout the animal kingdom. But we don't know about that, because we, we ourselves, even as vegans, regard other species as, like, you know, as, as part of this compulsory or compulsive heterosexual community, when in fact they're not. Oh, these, this is the vegan bros, um, and like this is this is another way that we reinforce like you know hyper masculinity and indeed toxic masculinity in our activism. Like they were quoted, um, and I'll just read this from this was like from the Guardian. It says here, if you want to see the face or to be more accurate, the body of the new wave of veganism, head to the website of the Vegan Bros. There, with their tops off, smooth and firm as tofu, <laughs> are. I forget who wrote this, but our, uh, whatever. I'm like, uh, our, our brothers, Matt and Phil Letton, they swear and they brag. They're the self-proclaimed leaders of an army of fit, sexy, vegan soldiers. They say, so first of all, fit, sexy, vegan soldiers, you're in reinforcing like a paradigm of like imperialism um, and empiricism that like is absurd. Like we don't need soldiers. We, we, we actually need activists. Um, they say things such as the animals are counting on us not to fuck shit up for them and suggest that the reason, hold on to your seats, they suggest that the reason they got so ripped and to use a non-vegan adjective, beefy, was because the animals deserve better than a stereotypical, stereotypical skinny ass vegan. My question to you gentlemen is what the fuck makes you think that the animals deserve your simple-minded ass? <laughs> because I can assure you that you are not a better activist than someone who gets out there pounding the street every fucking day. You're not inherently better because you're ripped or because you're muscular or because you reproduce toxic white masculinity. You are not what the animals need. And perhaps the animals don't need me either, but the animals are certainly not benefited by you reproducing that type of rhetoric and it has no fucking place in my movement. And it shouldn't have any place in your movement either. This is an image of Honey LeBronx. I don't know if you all are familiar with, with, with Honey. Honey is great. I actually had a couple of conversations with Honey before I left New York. Honey LeBronx is a drag performer. And, like, and she's great. If you ever have a chance to go to New York, see her because she is phenomenal. And like, you know, Honey actually just got through speaking in Iceland and in Berlin um, like this past summer in, in, in August. And like, you know, and I'm, I'm really glad that, like, that they sought input from me as a queer black vegan myself um, before engaging in discussions about intersectionality because like, they didn't want to be appropriative in the way that they presented the argument and they wanted to be respectful of where intersectionality came from. Um, and the roots of it, and so like you know, and, and so like if the if the animals need anything, the animals can definitely use honey. She's as just as good, as good an activist as anybody else, and they live their vegan ethic. Watch the YouTube videos. Like Honey LeBron has the the the, the drag cooking show, um, and like you know, and and like she's she's really a lot of fun in person, and a great singer too, unlike myself. Um, and I also just want to point out that like you know that that that. Like the, the image of the like you know of 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 masculinity that is being perpetuated by people like the vegan bros is an inaccurate one. This actually came from the Telegraph X. Boy, this is what happens when you put your like slides together in like ten minutes right before the presentation. Um, <laughs> You know, this is, this is a quote from The Telegraph, uh, an article by Helen Horton. Um, this was an, a, 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 like this was a survey that was done by YouGov. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but YouGov actually has some pretty accurate and, and reliable statistics. It says a total of 49% of 18 to 24 year olds who took part in the survey define themselves as something other than totally heterosexual. Of that 49%, only 6% identified as totally homosexual with the remaining 43% placing themselves somewhere along the Kinsey scale of sexual orientation. In the same survey, 46% of those aged 18 to 24 saw themselves as totally heterosexual. This is in stark contrast with the general population of the UK with 72% defining themselves as exclusively heterosexual and 28% falling somewhere else on the Kinsey scale, which even still, like almost 30% of the population is not straight when you're like, you know, when, when you're like in the general population, that's pretty fucking huge. 
And like some people would argue that like, oh, well, young people are experimenting and after they reach a certain age, then they'll settle into like, you know, a, a normal heterosexual role. Heterosexuality may be perceived as more common, but as this statistic reflects, it is not. We think that it's more common, but what's actually more common is queerness. And so when we have these narratives of hypermasculinity, of like, you know, of, 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 the, of the commonality of like, you know, of, of heterosexuality, of heteronormativity, like that's actually inaccurate. I personally don't think that people are going to settle into like more heterosexual roles as they age. I think that what we're looking at is an accurate reflection of who people actually are because we're normalizing queerness in our society and people are feeling more comfortable being honest about who the fuck they are rather than needing to hide it under a veil or a disguise of heterosexuality for fear of persecution. So this is actually the reality that we're looking at. You may think that you're promoting animal rights, you may think that you're promoting like, justice when you're promoting the normality or the, the normalization of heteronormativity, but in, re in, in reality what we're doing is we're not looking at accurate data. They suggest that more than half of people actually identify with something other than exclusively heterosexual on the scale. There are inherent problems with the Kinsey scale too, but I'm down to like, like 30 seconds, so I gotta wrap this up. Um, you know, this is a quote from Justin Van Cleek, who is a friend of mine. He um, also works at Vegan Publishers, and he and his wife Rosemary run Triangle Chance for Life Micro Sanctuary. Give them money, um, by the way. Like you know, in in uh, in North Carolina, uh, this this was from a piece that he wrote for Vegan Publishers. Um, as a vegan man, I've been particularly, and he's a heterosexual white vegan man too. Um, I've been particularly bothered by these efforts to save masculinity from the threat of veganism, or put another way, I felt deeply disconcerted by the attempts of some to save masculinity from supposed threats through an effort to make it subsume those threats within itself. From my perspective, masculinity and the entire system of rigid gender binaries are not worth saving. They're not worth shoring up, they're not worth bailing out, and they're not worth the harm to be done by hamstringing the subversive of political energy of ethical veganism. And he goes on to say, let me be blunt. I do not want masculinity to feel safe about veganism because I don't want patriarchy to squelch yet another effort to bring it down, which I believe ethical veganism damn well ought to be doing. I do not want my life as a vegan man to be constantly measured against some code of abstract qualities from appearance to behavior so that some of my fellow males might not worry about becoming more feminine should they decide to live a kinder life and go vegan. And just to wrap things all up, like I'm just gonna give you all a couple of resources because I want you all to like take this talk and like, you know, and leave the room and, and do your own homework, do your own research. Um, so these are some things that I've used in the classroom. This is a book called Evolution's Rainbow, which was written by Dr. Joan Roughgarden that does discuss the diversity of, of sexual orientation and gender presentation throughout the animal kingdom. It's really funny because like Dr. Roughgarden, who is again not vegan, always a disappointment to me. Um, like, you know, like she teaches at like, you know, at at Stanford University and as a trans woman she wrote this book and the book receives a lot of criticism because like you know from the larger academic community they're like well like you know this is not unbiased research you have an agenda because you are part of the queer community so of course you see these things let's turn that conversation around I think you have an agenda because you're heterosexual and you're part of the broader community of people that you feel like are unbiased because we inherently think of white straight maleness as unbiased and everybody else has an agenda. You have your biases just like everyone else. You just don't see them because we consider them to be normal and the standard by which we measure everything else. Well, we should be, in fact, decentering that narrative in all of our activism, including our animal rights activism. And we're gonna wrap up because I love Patrice Jones. Patrice is having a, veg, a presentation here at VegFest, but that's going to be um, over Skype. Definitely see that if you have the opportunity. I don't know what time it's going to be, but Patrice is, um, like, I, like I said, Patrice runs Vine Sanctuary. Um, Patrice has written um, a couple of great books, among them being The Oxen at the Intersection, a profound book. Um, and like you know, and, and aftershock, which actually talks about like self care, and like you know, the 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 importance of like confronting trauma, as it says in the cover, um, con confronting trauma in a violent world, um, because we're all 
damaged individuals as we do this type of activism. I know that it's never easy for me to actually read and do the things that I do. I know that when I'm talking about like anti-black racism and white fragility in front of largely audiences that are largely hostile or at the very least unknowledgeable about these subjects, that like, you know, it is a, an incredible type of like psychic abuse and emotional trauma that I experience every single day. Um, and when we, when we have these conversations with, with, with like straight individuals or straight identified individuals about queerness and animal rights, um, that can be equally traumatic as well. So, so I def definitely recommend both of these books by Patrice. Um, I definitely recommend that everybody in this room do their own homework. I definitely hope that like you take the conversation that we had here and the points that I raised into your larger circles when you're having conversations with your like you know with your queer identified um, friends. And you know, you you bring these points up. You talk about how including animal rights within their queer liberation framework is an important part of gaining your liberation. Because the two don't exist in isolation. Oppression never exists in isolation. Oppression relies on I isolation in order to keep the dominant paradigm intact. And we should definitely be working to topple that paradigm. Thank you all so much for being here. Okay, thank you, by the way. You're all awesome, I'm sweaty. I'm gonna take some of this coffee. Thank you, Esther, for bringing me coffee. <laughs>